So hey guys, uh, welcome back to our advanced lecture series. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about segment trees, which of all the advanced lectures we're going to do over this semester and the next semester, this is probably one of the most common topics you're going to see in contests. Um, so this is definitely a very useful thing to understand. So basically what we want to do with segment trees is you have an array A of size N of some value type. Usually it'll be integers, but uh, not always. We'll get into some weird cases toward the end. Um, and basically we want to be able to update a value A in log N and do some kind of range queries also in log N. Um, so one problem we could look at is you have an array of N integers and you want to do two queries. One where you increase AI by K um, and two, you want to return the sum of all the elements from AI to AJ. So range sum, and you want to update a point value by increasing it. And we want to do both of these in log n time. OK, so basically how we're going to do this is uh, we're going to make a binary tree where each node uh, holds the sum of elements in a given range. So the root of the tree is going to represent the whole array. So it'll hold the sum of everything. And then we're going to split every node into a left and right child by basically splitting that subarray in half. Um, so for example, let's say our array was this. Um, you can see each of these nodes uh, represents a range of the array, right? So zero to six is the whole array. So we have that as the root, then zero to three is the left half and four to six is the right half. Um, if there's an odd number, we can just kind of break that tie arbitrarily. We don't, it doesn't have to be exactly even, but the left and the right child will be off by at most one. Um, and so you see, we keep recursively doing this. Um, so we split zero, three into zero, one and two, three. We split two, three into two and three. Um, and you just keep doing this until you get down to the leaves which each only hold one value. And as you can see, um, each of these nodes is holding the sum of everything in its range. So for the leaves, that's easy because that's just the array itself, right? Because the sum of just this one element is just the one element. So if you go across the leaves in order, two, four, six, one, three, five, two, that's just your original array. And then for every other node, we can compute the sum in this node by taking the sum of the two children, right? Because we're splitting the range up into the two children. So um, the sum of the range is just the sum of the children. Any questions on this structure? One thing to notice here is we're using at most two n nodes um, that's because if you have a binary tree like this, where every vertex has either one, has either uh, two children or no children, then the number of vertices is, I think, two times number of leaves minus one. Um, so here we have at most two end nodes if we split it up like this. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is sort of the structure we're going to try to build. And now, um, if we want to query on a range, we can break up any arbitrary range in the array into log n nodes. So let's say we want to query 1, 4. We can split that up into 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, and you can show that you can split up any range like this into, at most, log n of these blocks. Um, and we'll kind of show that as we show the algorithm for how exactly to do that. Because once you see how you can do that, it's, it becomes clear why you only get log n of these. Um, so the way we're going to implement this is we're going to represent this tree as an array. Um, so every one of these vertices is going to be one element of an array. And um, it's going to hold the sum like it does here. And the way we do that is we're going to assign uh, index one to the root. 
And then for any vertex um, with a value of like i, the left child is going to be 2i and the right child is going to be 2i plus 1. So if you look at this, um, the root would be 1, then this is 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. So it basically goes across the levels like that. Um, if any of you have tried to do anything with like implementing your own heaps before, um, this will be kind of similar to that structure. Yeah, and uh, because we're doing it this way, um, even though we only have two end nodes, um, we are going to skip over some elements here. Um, so it could go up to four end memory, um, but that's fine because we're still uh, linear in terms of memory. Okay. Yeah, so here's the actual algorithm we're going to use to split up a range um, and sort of find which blocks make it up. So you start out at the root, okay? And then for every node we're querying, um, you take your query range. So let's say we want to get the sum of one to three. Um, if this range here is a subset of one to three, um, then we can just return this sum and we don't need to go down any further. That's not the case here. Um, if this range doesn't intersect one, three, then we can just stop and add nothing. That's also not the case here. Um, but if this, if these two ranges intersect and this one is not a subset of this one, then we want to recurse to the two children, right? So uh, let's look at the right child first. So uh, we go down to the right child. One, three does not intersect with four, six. So we can basically just ignore this, return zero for this, right? because none of this is going to add anything to our sum. On the left child, um, once again, for 0, 3, um, these intersect, but this is not contained within this. So again, we have to recurse the two children. Um, 2, 3 falls completely within 1, 3. So we can just return the sum here. Um, and then over here, uh, once again, 0, 1. Again, we have to recurse down to the two children. 0 does not intersect here, so we just return 0. And 1 lies completely inside, so we return 4. And you kind of do this recursive process, and you add up um, everything you get in these yellow ones across all the queries, and that'll give you your answer. Does this make sense to everyone? Um, definitely, if you have questions about this, please ask, because other people probably have the same questions. Basically, the idea is if you don't intersect at all, that's obviously not going to contribute anything to your sum. And if you're fully inside, then that's going to definitely be completely within your sum. And otherwise, you have to recurse. Um, you could do, you probably could do some kind of binary search. Um, but that wouldn't speed you up overall. So it would still be a log factor. And this structure we have here is much nicer uh, when you want to deal with updates too, which we haven't talked about yet. And as you do this, you're only going to visit log n nodes because um, you can only really traverse down. Like if you look at these vertices we traverse that aren't red or yellow, you, you can only go like log n of these because um, if you traverse down to two children, they can't both be these unhighlighted ones based on how we defined this. OK, um, let's move on. See any other questions? OK, yeah. so the pseudocode for the query would basically look like this. So we're doing this uh, recursive function that queries, where i is the index. So like the root is index 1. Um, and then the children are 2i and 2i plus 1. We just do that process. Um, L and R are the uh, basically these values. So we're at index i. So like the root is index 0. 
And then L and R would be zero and N minus one, the group. Um, and then QL, QR is our query range. So the left point of the query, the right point of the query. So um, th this is all pseudocode. So you'd have to write a bit more for this to actually work. But the idea is if LR doesn't intersect QL, QR, you can return zero. Um, if LR lies inside QL, QR, you can just return seg tree i. Otherwise, you're basically going to go to the two children, which are 2i and 2i plus 1, and you're going to add the queries there. All right, questions on this pseudocode? OK. And uh, we're computing M here so that we know what the ranges for the children are, right? Because if you're 0, 6, um, you want to find what the middle point is, so 3 in this case. So you just take L plus R and divide by 2 uh, in your division. And that'll give you the right end point of this one. OK. All right, so now we're going to talk about updates. So the other type of uh, query we need to do is increase AI by K. And notice that uh, the only values we need to increment are uh, the leaf that corresponds to AI and all of its ancestors. And there's only going to be log n of these because the depth of this tree is log n because we're decreasing the size of the array by a factor of two at every step. So you only have log n parents to update here. And if we want to increase AI by k, all we have to do is add k to each of these ancestors, right? So that's how we can do this. This is a lot more uh, straightforward, both conceptually and in terms of implementation than the queries. And then the pseudocode for this. Um, so again, you the way we're doing this is we're starting at the root and we're traversing down. Um, but you can sort of do it either way. Um, but basically, you just add QV, which is the amount we want to add to AI. Um, basically, QI is I in the query. Um, and QV is the amount we want to add to A QI. And then ILR is the same as what we had in uh, the query function where i is the index of the node and lr is this range we have here. And basically, uh, you're traversing down um, to one of the children based on whether qi lies in the first half or the second half. All right, questions on how to do updates? Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go over an implementation that we use for sectories, um, which is different, a little bit different than the way we've been talking about it so far. So we've been doing um, the recursive sectory so far uh, with 4N memory. Um, and that's, um, I guess, a little bit easier to conceptualize when you're seeing it for the first time. But the recursion will slow your code down a bit. Um, and also, the iterative one that we're going to show here only takes 2n memory. Um, we're not going to go into exactly why this works, because it's um, pretty confusing and definitely harder to understand. Um, but we're going to talk about how you can use the template um, to solve problems. Because like a lot of the other topics we've talked about, um, once you have a template for this, you can really just use it without thinking too much about how it works. And the link to this template is at the end of the slides. So basically, the structure of this code is um, you have uh, this type def uh, t. And basically, t is going to be the type of elements that we want in our array. Um, so like I said, usually we do that as LLs, so integers. Um, but there can be times where you want to do a different type. Um, and so we also need um, an identity element. 
Um, so something that if you combine it with another element, will just produce that same element. Um, so for example, if you want the sum of a range, your identity would be zero, right? Because zero plus anything is just that same thing. If you're doing multiplication, the identity would be one. Um, you basically just need to find some element like that. And then this array T is going to be our actual like array for the blocks. So each element of T represents a block in the tree. Um, we also have this function F, which is the way that we are going to combine two nodes. So in the previous function, or in the previous problem we had, um, the way to get the value of a node was you take the sum of the values of its children, right? So that's what we're doing here. This is basically, if your children have values A and B, what values do you have, right? So in the one we had before, that's just A plus B. Um, but this could be really any function as long as it's associative. So basically, it doesn't matter how you group the parentheses, um, the values will be the same. So some examples of functions we could use here are addition, multiplication, um, GCD, max, min. Um, basically, most functions will work here. Most functions that you'll see in like a competitive programming problem. Um, yeah, and then the two functions we have here that you'll really be working with the most are modify and query. So modify uh, sets a p equal to v. Notice that v is of type t, which is our um, type for the array here. And then query lr gives you the query from l to r. Um, and notice that this returns a t. So this is returning basically um, like if you take the f value of everything in that range. So it's returning. Questions on the basic structure here? Okay. Uh, so for the modify, um, basically what this does is this is kind of going backwards from the recursive one we had, where it's starting out at um, the leaf and it's going to go all the way up to the root. Um, so in general, this template uh, tends to work up from the leaves rather than down from the root, which is one difference from what we had. Um, but other than that, this is basically the same. So you don't have to worry too much about what exactly this means. Um, this has been basically condensed down to be as short as possible. Um, so that also makes it a lot more confusing than the code we had before. But essentially, this is just going to update the value of position i and then all of its parents. Um, and there's also this build operation. We don't really use this often um, because you can just do n modify operations. Um, but if you want to do them all at once, this would reduce the complexity of your initial modifications from n log n to n. Um, but it doesn't really tend to matter. So this is kind of an optional function we don't really use. Uh, and then the query, um, basically, like I said, it's starting from the leaves and it's going upward um, until sort of your two leaves meet at a node um, and then it stops. Um, but again, we don't have to worry too much about the actual specifics here. Okay. So yeah, the full template is basically gonna look like this. And the only parts you have to really think about modifying are um, what type is T, what is your identity, and what is F. So those are really the only three things you need to like fully be able to modify in this, because the, the rest of this will just work as long as these three work. Any questions on the template? Okay. So now we're going to talk about how to do range updates, right? Because all we have at this point are we have point updates. So you can update a given element. You can update like one element. And we have range queries. So you can query on a range. 
Um, but now we want to be able to update a range. So the first way we're going to talk about doing that is what we call an inverse segment tree. I don't think this is the official name. Um, but basically what this lets you do is instead of point updates and range queries, we want range updates and point queries. Um, so you can't query on a range anymore, um, but you can update a range essentially. And again, these are going to be log in for both still. Um, and this can be done by sort of slight modifications to the template we just showed. Uh, essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to kind of switch the code for the updates and the queries. Um, again, you don't have to worry too much about what exactly is happening in that code. Um, but basically, the modifies look like this. Um, if you look back at the query function in the original seg tree, uh, it's going to look a lot like this, where um, you basically keep dividing L and R by two until they're equal. Um, and you're checking if they're odd. And if you are, you're combining them. Um, it, it's basically structured very similarly to the queries from before. And in the same way, the queries are structured in very much the same way that the modifies were from before. Um, so instead of updating all the parents, we are now uh, basically taking the F value of all the parents, which are kind of holding the updates that we've had so far. Okay, any questions on this? Okay. Again, the exact implementation is not super important here, just the general idea. Uh, but a much more powerful tool we can use for range updates is lazy propagation. And what this lets us do is range updates and range queries in login time. And the idea is you want to temporarily store updates at each node um, in a separate array, and then push the updates to your children when you you need to, essentially. Um, so basically with this, OK, so one sample problem you could have with lazy propagation is um, two types of queries. You want to increase all elements in a range by k, and then you want to print the maximum element in a range, so. And the way we would do this with lazy prop is um, basically, if you want to increase um, the all the elements on a range. What you do is you split that range up into blocks, right? And as you're traversing down, um, you want to update all of these nodes, right? So you update all these nodes as you traverse down, which is fine because there's only log n of them. Um, but then at every node where you stop, you're also going to store um, this lazy update here. And basically what this lazy update means is whenever you're trying to traverse down to this node's children, before you do that, you have to push this update down to the children. Right? So let's say we get a node, let's say we get a query where we need this block. As we traverse down, we're going to see this lazy update. And so before we go down here, we're going to push the lazy update down here and then update this value accordingly. And then we're going to uh, clear the lazy value here. So when we go to this node and we see an update, we're going to push it down to both the children, apply it to both the children, and then remove the update here. Does that make sense, Typhoon? The idea is we're kind of storing the update here, because if we tried to push it down to all of its children right now, that would take linear time because th this subtree might be like basically the whole array. Um, but we don't need to do that because we don't need to push it down until we have a query that's going to go past this node. And so once we get a query that goes to this node, we can just push the updates here um, and then traverse down. And then when we push this update down here, we're then going to put this lazy value three on this node. So if we ever have to push down to here, we can do that. Any questions on this? This is 
probably one of the most confusing things we're gonna talk about today. Okay. So the pseudocode for doing an update would basically look like this. Um, so if there's a pending value at this node, um, we want to first apply that value to its children um, and then set the pending value to zero, right? So this is basically what I was talking about before, where when you visit a node, you want to send its value down to its children. Um, and then um, we're basically going to do the normal um, secretary range thing, where if the ranges don't intersect, then we return because we're done. If it lies inside, then we want to apply the value to it, like to the whole range, because the whole range lies inside. Um, and then you basically recurse down to the children. Questions on this? Okay. Yeah, and then uh, for queries, it's basically going to work the same way as non-lazy prop queries, so normal secretary queries. Uh, but we just need to check if pend i needs to be applied at each node. Um, so you're basically just doing a normal query, except you're pushing the pending values down as you go and applying them. And the implementation is going to look very similar to this. Okay. So now, uh, just like we did for iterative, or for the normal secretaries, we're going to go over a uh, implementation we have for an iterative lazy prop um, template. Uh, and this gets much more complicated than the non-lazy prop, um, which is why we use that normal secretary template a lot, because uh, there's just a lot more code here. Um, because otherwise, if this was like the same length as the normal one, you could just use this all the time. Um, but basically, uh, for this template, it looks like this. So there's a lot of code here. We're not going to go in depth into how everything works. Um, but like with the other template, we're going to explain what you need to be able to use uh, to use this template. OK, so this is the important parts that you need to be able to change. So just like before, um, T is going to be the type that we hold in the secretary nodes. Um, and D is going to be the type of the updates, right? which could be a different type from what you're storing here. And often it is. Um, and so you have your identity for T, which is ID from before. Um, but you also need an identity for D, which is basically an update that you can push onto a node that won't do anything to it. Um, and we'll do an example of this on the next slide. Um, and then the other important part is these three functions, F, G, and H. Um, so in the previous entry, we just had F, but now that we have these updates, we need to have three different functions to do all this. So f is the same as it was before. So if a and b are the values in your child, what is your value? Right, so that's the same as before. g a b is if you have a lazy update b and you want to apply that to a node a, what does that give you? Um, and you, so you have a separate function for that. And then h a and b is a and b are both lazy updates. So they're both type d. And we need to combine them into one lazy update, right? So this is like, if you get one lazy update and then another lazy update comes along, how do we combine them into one update? That's what H is for. So this is all really abstract. So we're now gonna sort of show an example for what all of this would look like in one problem. Uh, with you, uh, do you mention uh, like the sort of constraints you need to have on them that they need to be Associative and that uh, 
it needs to be well formed in the sense that like do you talk about this or should I, I talked about it being associative um no but there, the, like the lazy one has a lot more restrictions i think you can do the examples it? I, yeah it does for example okay. yeah, i can mention them later uh, but once you, i think it's much better to do the examples first okay yeah so uh, one example is let's say we have these two types of queries where one is we want to print the sum of the elements from l to r and the other is we want to increase ai by x for all i in the range l to r right so we're doing a range add here and a range sum here so um our type t you might initially think um that type t can just be the sum right because that's all we want but it turns out we need to store a little bit more inside t um, and we're actually going to have t be a pair of two integers where one is the sum and two is the length of the current array right because that's not something we have access to in this template um, the way we have it implemented in the lazy prep i was talking about before you could probably get that in a more natural way. Um, but with this template, you sort of want to store length as its own thing, like um, as part of the node, sort of. OK, so our array is holding um, pairs with some comma length of the interval for this node. And then our lazy type is an integer, um, which is basically just how much do we need to add to this node? Um, so it's, it's basically what is the current size of the lazy update for this node? So our identity for t is going to be 0, 0, um, basically 0 sum, 0 length. And our identity for d is going to be 0, because uh, adding 0 to a range is the same as doing nothing. And sometimes you can't get a d that works like that. But if you can, uh, you always want to try to do that. OK, and so here is what f, g, and h would look like. Here. And if you can't get a d that has that, the trick you do is you make you add a special value and just sort of right. sort of force it in there and add if statements to make sure it's a fake identity, sort of. Yeah, like let's say negative 1 was an impossible value to have as an update. You could make your identity negative 1, and then anytime you're pushing an update, like in g or h, you'd have to check if it was negative 1. But making it 0 just makes it easier to work with here. OK. so. Uh, Let's look at f first. So if we have two nodes, a and b, how do we combine them? So the sum of the parent of a and b is going to be the sum of a, which is a dot first, plus the sum of b, which is b dot first. And the length of that interval is going to be the length of the interval of a plus the length of the interval of b. So we're basically combining the uh, length and the sum to get the length and the sum of the parent. Does this make sense to everybody? OK. And now, if we want to apply an update, uh, basically, if we want to increment everything on A by B, um, what does that do to the sum? Well, it's going to increase the sum by B times the length of A. Right, because if we have five things in the interval and we're increasing everything by two, the sum's going to go up by 10 because we're increasing five things by two. So the sum is now the old sum plus the length times b. And the length is going to stay the same. Right, so this is like our uh, sum length pair here. So the sum is this part and the length is here. The length is basically the same as well as before. And finally, for h, if we want to combine two updates, so let's say we want to add 2 on a range, and then we want to add 5 on that same range, um, that's the same as just adding 7 on that range. So we can combine those updates by just returning a plus b. Any questions on? Any of this? OK. Um, and then the functions you can use are um, modify p, which will 
modify a point. Um, so you give it an index and you give it, uh, notice that this is a T value that you're giving it here. Um, so this will set the value at an index to a given T value. Um, and then if you want to do a range modify, you give it uh, a range and then a D value, right? Because if you want to propagate something onto a range, it has to be like a lazy update. Uh, it can't be a T value like it is here. And then you have query LR, which will give you the query on the range L to R, same as before. Questions on this? Okay. All right, so now we're going to get Can I into... jump in here in just two oh, minutes? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a good... You might want to on restrictions. Yeah. Right, you can go back to the slide with the F and... Yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or, or the next one, I guess. Okay. Right, yeah. Uh, so first off, um, as Joe mentioned earlier, uh, 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 that the T thing has to be associative. So F has to be associative when it's combining T values. And similarly, uh, H has to be associative when it's combining D values. Um, but the sort of additional thing you get here is that these things have to sort of play nice with each other. So first off, um, if you uh, do a G on some T value and then do another G on the T value, that has to be the same as if you did just a single G with the H of those two values. So I don't know if that, if you comprehend, if you can understand what I said, but like, if you have like, I don't know, if you, in, in this context, it means if you add five and then you later add seven, that should be the same as adding 12. So it works here. Um, and the second uh, sort of restriction is that um, if you apply a G to one node, to one value, um, it has to be the same as if you did an F on the G of its, comp of its uh, inputs. So what that means is that if you add five to a big range, it has to be the same as if you add five to each of its children. Um, and so, yeah, those are the two things you need to make sure that your functions, because if your functions don't follow that, then you did something wrong and it's not going to work. And, you're, just, you're not really doing what you want it to. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, so now we can get into sample problems. So the first problem is longest increasing subsequence. So given an array A of n integers, you want to return the length of its longest increasing subsequence in n log n time. Um, so longest increasing subsequence is um, basically you take some subset of the array in uh, in order, and that has to be ascending. So like here, if you take all of these red indices, notice that the values here are increasing, right? One, two, five, seven, eight. Um, so you want to find, yeah, basically the longest sequence of increase, the longest increasing subsequence of indices such that the values are also increasing, if that makes any sense. And the one hint I would give for this is think about how you could do like kind of a DP type thing here. It's not exactly DP, um, but it's close. I mean, like, what would even the uh, n squared solution be? Think of that first, and right, that's yeah. pretty close to what the n to the uh, secondary solution is. Uh, greedy in what sense? So think about how to do the n squared solution first, um, which I, I think I know what you're saying with the greedy. Um, think about how you can, uh, I guess, turn that greedy solution into like an n squared brute force type thing. Um, yeah, I, I think I know what you're saying with the greedy.
Yeah, like you start thinking about how to do this as like an N squared DP um, will be very helpful. Basically, like if you want to compute the length of the LIS up to a given index, how would you do that? Start with the end. Um, not, you don't always want to take the biggest element you can, right? So like, let's say you had, I'll type in chat, like, uh, six. I mean, you have a counterexample right there. Because uh, his thing, you go eight, seven, five, and then there's four right there, which you don't take. Yeah, that works too. Um, yeah, or, or something like six, one, two, three, seven. Um, because if you're starting with the seven, the six is going to be the biggest thing. But by taking that, you're missing out on the one, two, three. So you're definitely like, you're definitely close to the n squared. Um, but I think you're kind of still trying to make this like an O of N or an O of N log N. Um, but how can you like weaken the solution you had um, and make it N squared? Just kind of make it more of a brute force type solution. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of going in the opposite direction, but it'll do the same thing. So if you're at some position i, like let's say you're at this two, at this five, um, look at every position after you. Or actually, the solution we have is going to go the other way, so I'll just go this way. Um, look at everything. Uh, let's take this three. Let's say you're at this three. Uh, look at everything before you. Um, basically, iterate over every position. If it's less than three. Um, take the LIS up to this point and add one, right? Because what you can do is take any increasing subsequence in this part of the array and then add the three to the end of it. Um, and same thing here, you can take any increasing subsequence on this one and then add the three to it. We're basically iterating as over what's the second to last yeah. element. As long as the one is less than three, that's the one. Right, element. exactly. We're, we're only iterating over positions where the value is less than three which means we can add three to the end of it because we're iterating over the second to last element, essentially. And so if we did this out, this would be an O of n squared dp um, because you're computing a dp value for each of these n positions. And for each one, you iterate over the whole array n times, or you iterate over the array once, but you do that for each index, so it's n times. Any questions on the n squared solution? So now the question is, um, given this n squared solution we have, um, how can we bring it down to n log n using a seg tree? So we want to sort of have the same structure. So we want to go over every index in order and compute the LIS up to that index. But rather than iterating over everything to the left of it, we want to uh, do something faster than that using a segment tree. How can we do something there? Uh, maybe for this, it's useful to sort of formally state what the n squared approach is. Um, and mm -hmm. so, so like we, the n squared approach was to take the maximum of the current LIS, the, the old DP values, of all the values that are smaller than you. Um, yeah, so let me type that out. That up. Basically that. So it's a max over all j less than i, where aj is also less than ai, um, of dpj plus 1. 
So how can we kind of move the structure of this problem around a little bit um, so that we can turn that into a segment tree problem? Right. So the problem is we have like two dimensions here, right? Because um, it's it, it not only has to be at an index to the left of AI, but it also has to be smaller than AI. So we want to kind of like shift around the structure of this array and kind of make a new array such that the we can do something nicer here and it'll be a lot more one dimensional. It's, it's literally two-dimensional, as Joe was saying. If you look at the thing he typed on chat, you're literally doing a lesson among two, di two different dimensions there. Yeah. That's really... I think I'll show you guys this one because this is definitely a hard thing to see if you haven't seen it before. So basically what we're going to do um, is the secretary is going to maintain LIS of I, which is basically our DP array um, here. So LIS of I is the length of the, the best uh, LIS, or I guess just the LIS ending at position I. Um, oh, no, this is, sorry, this is not exactly our DP. LIS of I is the current best LIS that ends with the value of I. Um, so for example, like here, if we wanted the best LIS ending here, this would be contributing to LIS of seven, um, not LIS of four or whatever position this is. Um, so we can initialize all of these LISs to zero. And then, uh, we're going to iterate through all the elements of the array in order and set LIS of AI to the max query from zero to AI minus one plus one. So this is very confusing um, without seeing an example. So uh, we're just going to go into an example for this. OK, so here's our array. And it's going to hold the length of the, the current length of the LIS that ends at every value, right? And the way we're going to do that is, so our first element is 1. Um, so the best LIS we can get at 1 is going to be the current best LIS that ends at something less than 1 plus 1. And so the way we do that is we take a max query over everything to the left of 1. And then we're going to add 1 because we're appending 1 to the end of that. So then at the second element, now we have four. So we're once again doing a max query on everything to the left of the current element. And here the, ma the max is now one, right? And why is the max one? Because um, we have an element here to the left of four where we have an LIS of length one. So we can add four to the end of that because uh, one is less than four. And so we get an LIS of two for four. Um, so then the next element we get is two. And we're once again can do a max query on everything to the left. The best length we have to the left is the one. Uh, so this gets a value of one plus one, which is two. Because we're appending the two to the end of this one list. 
Uh, then we have four again, and the max here is two because we can append this four to the end of the two list. So we have three. Then we get seven. Um, we have an LIS of length three here. So we append seven to the end of that and we get four. Three, we have one of length two. We can add one and get one of length three. Six, we have either the three or the four LIS, right? Because we have either one, two, three, or one, two, four. Either one of those, we can add the six to and get four. And finally, um, we have this one, two, three sequence ending at three. So we can add this four to the end of that to get a length of four. And then if we want the answer across the whole array, we just take the max of everything here. Does this process make sense to everyone? So we're kind of eliminating one of the dimensions by only process by only inserting elements with j less than i into the array, right? Because at the point where we're inserting ai, we haven't inserted anything with j greater than i, so we don't have to worry about this first dimension of the max here. Any questions on this? Is that something? Sorry. OK, um, I guess we can move on. OK, range less than queries. So uh, for this problem, you get an array A of n integers. And we're going to get queries of the form LRK, where we want to return the number of elements on the segment L to R that are less than k. Um, so for example, if this was our array and we got the range 0 to 2 with k equals 4, uh, we're looking here on these first three elements. And there are two elements less than 4, so we return 2. Um, and if we're looking at range 2 to 3 with k equals 3, that's these two elements. No elements are less than 3, so we return 0. So there's a couple important hints for this problem. Um, where one is the structure we're going to use to solve this problem is called merge sort tree. So if you've seen merge sort before, that will probably be helpful. Um, there are no update queries here. And our queries can be log squared n or better. So we have an extra log n factor we can add on. And basically the reason for that is we want to be able to process every block in the segment tree in log n time. So this is a problem where we're not going to be storing integers in the segment tree. Um, this is going to be a very specialized segment tree where you, you can't even do update queries. Um, but think about like if you're storing some kind of specialized type instead of an integer um, in your segment tree, what can you do with that in like log n time? I guess the first thing to think about is like, what would that type be? Like what would be a useful thing to store rather than a single integer? Yeah, exactly. Um, so you're going to store basically uh, a sorted 
version of every interval in the node. And that's the idea behind a merge sort tree. So your T is going to be, um, like we said, a sorted list of integers um, where every leaf is a list that just contains the single value AI. And then every other node is going to contain all the elements in both of its children. Um, so when we want to join two nodes, uh, so for example, when we have the values in the children and we want to join them to the parent, we can merge them like in merge sort, if you've seen that. Basically, the idea is you keep uh, pulling off the minimum of the two fronts of the lists and adding that to your new list. Um, and then that'll give you a new list that's already sorted. And it will do that in linear time. So um, the total space is going to be n log n, which we'll show in the next slide. And construction time is also going to be n log n. Yeah, so basically, if your original array was this, the idea is in every node, we want to store a sorted version of um, all of the elements in that node. So for example, for the root, we basically just have the original array, but sorted. Um, and here for um, two, three, that's this range here. We basically just have this range sorted, which is one, six. And the way we build this is we're first going to add values to the leaves, right? So we're going to add two, four, six, one, three, five, two. Um, so once again, the leaves are just the elements of the array in order. And then we're going to build every element after that from its two children. So basically, let's say we're building this and we have these values already. Um, you're going to basically do what you would do in merge sort, where you have um, basically pointers to the beginning of this list and the beginning of this list. And you keep uh, adding whichever the smaller one is to this list until they both at the end. So here, one is smaller than two, so we had one. And we move this to six. And two is smaller than six, so we had two. Four is smaller than six, so we had four. And then this list is empty, so we just add six. So we're basically doing merge sort to join each of these on the way up. And then when we want to do a query, we break every range up into log n disjoint nodes as usual. And then for each node, we can do a binary search to find the number of elements less than k and just add that up over all the log n nodes. So because um, each of the binary searches is log n, and we're doing that for each of the log n blocks, uh, the total runtime is log squared n. Did we, oh, I thought we had another picture of that. But basically, um, if you wanted to query on, say, the range 0 to 5, you would take these two nodes, do a binary search on each one. Like, let's say your value was 4. You do a binary search to find how many elements here are less than 4. So you, you would find that two elements are less than 4. And you do a binary search here, you find that one element's less than 4. And you would return 2 plus 1, which is 3. OK. So then the implementation looks very much like our segment tree implementation. Um, so the queries are, the query code is basically the same. Um, this f function is going to do a binary search. So lower bound does the binary search for you. Um, and then if you subtract off the begin iterator, it'll give you the index. Um, so this is like our built-in binary search here. And then we're doing build instead of modify. Because like I said before, we can't do point modifies here. Um, we can't modify things at all. So once we set um, all of the leaf values, we can do build, um, which will fill all the other values and let us query. Questions on this? OK. Last problem. So you have a string of A's and B's of size n, and you want to do two different types of operations in log n time. So one is swap all characters in the range L to R. So all A's become B's, all B's become A's. 
And the other one is you're going to basically execute this process for all I from L to R. So every time you encounter an A, so you have these variables A and B where you're given their initial values. And then you're gonna iterate through all I from L to R. If SI is equal to A, you're going to increase A by B. Otherwise you're gonna increase B by A. And you wanna print A and B at the end of this process. Um, so we could do these queries obviously in linear time by actually running this code, right? Um, but once again, we wanna be able to do this in log n time. So we have to kind of simulate this process in log n time. Um, and the first thing to think about is don't even think about trying to answer the queries right now, but think about like, what's a nice way to represent what is happening at every step? Like how can we represent this in a nicer way than an if statement? Actually, let me show you guys the next slide. I think that'll be helpful. So the idea is in every node, rather than a value, we want to in some sense store a function um, that will give you the final A and B values. And then um, like going across a range, you're basically gonna be composing those functions. So what, what is the function gonna look like is the real question. Like if you have an initial A and B, um, you then want some kind of a function or an object or something that will convert that A and B to be the new A and B after one step. Don't, don't even think about multiple steps at this point. Just think like one step, um, one character. What does that look like? Um, well, you have to update A and B. Right, so one of them is going to stay constant and the other one is going to be increased by the other one. Right, right so like, yeah. That's just an example to see that your thing is kind of wrong is that you can get exponential growth here. Because if you keep on swapping A, B, A, B, A, B, they'll sort of double every time. No, I think you were saying like just at one step. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, but you, you kind of need to be tracking the changes in both A and B. Okay, we're over time and this is a very complicated problem. So uh, I think I'll show you guys this next step. Um, basically, notice that we want to do matrix multiplication at every step, two by two matrix multiplication. So we have these two special matrices, MA and MB. And notice if we take uh, AB and we multiply it by MA, then we get A plus B, B, which is the result of applying A to AB, right? Because that's increasing A by B. If we take AB and we apply MB to it, that's going to give us A, A plus B, which is the same as applying B to AB. And then notice that this is associative because matrix multiplication is associative. Um, so the string ABA, basically the function on AB that that gives us is the matrix MA times MB times MA. Right, so here, our type in the seg tree 
is going to be two by two matrices. Um, and the way we combine them is going to be matrix multiplication. So when we do our range query, that's going to, it's not going to give us the answer for A and B. That's going to give us a two by two matrix that we can multiply A and B, that we can multiply like the pair A, B by um, to get the final answer. In a sense, it's going to give us the function uh, on A and B that we need. Does this make sense to everybody? So basically, when we do the queries, the steps are going to be first get the matrix, which will be our range query, um, which will give us basically the product of like MA times MB times MA times MA times MB, whatever the range is. Um, and then once we get that matrix from the query, we just multiply it by AB to get the answer. Okay, um, but this does not completely solve the problem, right? Because there's another type of query too. The other type of query is swap all the A's and B's in the string in this range. So turn all the A's to B's and vice versa. So how do we want to do that? The hint, I guess, is um, since we're updating on a range, um, we want to use lazy prop. So what are the types of our updates going to be? Or I guess the other way to think about it is um, what does doing a swap sort of do to these matrices? Uh, pretty much, that, that's close. Um, it's not quite a transpose, um, but basically you want to sort of reflect everything with the element diagonally opposite from it. Um, so you're, if you have a matrix A, B, C, D, you want to swap B and C, and then you also want to swap A and D. And the reason behind this is you're kind of swapping the roles of A and B. So you could think about like this A here as um, sending A to A, right? Because it's in sort of the A row and the A column. Um, but if we're swapping A and B, then the A row is now here and the A column is now here. So the idea is like you want to change the row and the column of every element, which corresponds to swapping the diagonals. And notice that uh, if we do this twice, we just get the original matrix back, which makes sense, right? Because if you swap all the characters on a range and you swap again, you get the same thing. So what that means is our updates, uh, like our update type can just be a Boolean. Like, do we need to swap the current matrix? Um, so we can, yeah, like I said, we can use lazy propagation to push these Boolean updates. Yeah, so this is um, what sort of the first part of the lazy prop template would look like for this problem. Um, again, this is sort of the only part you would need to change. Um, so we type def uh, two by two matrices to be our T. One way you could do that is a pair of pairs. That's probably going to be annoying to work with um, if you want two by two matrices. There's probably nicer ways of doing it than that, but what, that's one way to represent it. And then our lazy update is going to be a Boolean, which is just, do we need to swap the current node? Um, notice that our identity here is the identity matrix. So one, zero, zero, one. Um, and our identity for D is false, right? Because you want to initially have everything set to not need to be swapped. Um, so then our three functions, um, F is just going to do two by two matrix multiplication. I'm not going to write that out here because that would be just a lot of annoying code. Um, the G, uh, so if we want to apply an update to a matrix, if B is false, we return A, right? Because that means we don't need to swap A. Otherwise, we're going to return this matrix 
which is just A, but everything's reflected across the diagonal. And then if we want to compose two updates, we just need to return A does not equal B. Because if the updates are both false, um, then the final product is false. Um, if they're both true, then the final product is false because you swap it twice. And if they are not equal, then we're going to swap it once. You can think about this as sort of adding the mod to It'll do the same thing. All right. Uh, any questions on this? All right, cool. Um, so as always, we have uh, resources and problems in the next few slides. Um, and these slides are in the info channel on Discord. Um, oh, so I forgot to add a slide for it. Uh, but next week, we are going to start talking about topics that specifically show up at our ICPC regional. Um, so our ICPC regional has a lot of topics that most contests don't have. Um, and we're going to have our next two advanced lectures on uh, two of those topics specifically. So next week, we're going to talk about backtracking um, because there's usually uh, some kind of a Sudoku problem on the regional, which is really annoying to code if you don't have a template for it. But if you have a template, um, it can make it very easy to deal with. So it's definitely a useful thing to have for everyone interested in ICPC. So I encourage you guys to come there. So yeah, I hope to see you guys next week.